Okay, all right, so um, so the first thing, now I'm aware that in this group there are people who are well across what vocabularies are and also formal vocabularies and technical vocabularies and then there are people who are new to some of that. So um, I'm gonna start right at the beginning um, and it's only 10 minutes, so if you know all about it, you can, you can dual task or something, multitask. Uh, so, so people can, can do something else if they know this material, but it's only 10 minutes. Okay, um, Kim, can you still hear me? There was some issue there. Yes, I, I can hear you. Right, okay, all right. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is just to describe um, in a few minutes the different terms that we come across that describe vocabularies themselves um, because there's a lot of confusion about vocabularies and ontologies and so on usually. So um, I'll just go through a couple of little definitions here. Um, so I think everyone on this call would know what a dictionary is and we're talking about a, you know, an Oxford English dictionary style thing. Um, you know, they've been in use for a couple of centuries. Um, they let you come up with definitions for words, find definitions and so on, uh, terms. Um, and in addition to that definitional role, um, they also usually, are, well, they are a, a controlled list. You know, what is in the dictionary is in the dictionary. And you could say something like in a game of Scrabble, you can only use words from a certain dictionary. So that then becomes a controlled list. That dictionary is now your, the only place from which you can get words. And of course, you know, the authority is, to how you spell something, synonyms and so on, it may have thesaurus elements in there as well. So I think you know what dictionaries are, and um, they are uh, the, the definition of a dictionary is still applicable to everything we do in the digital and, and um, RDF and other ontology spaces. Um, so now a vocabulary, um, I think a vocabulary, is, you know, it doesn't have to have all the features of a dictionary, it could just be a list of terms that are used in a certain scenario. Um, so you could say the vocabulary of all the words that someone can use is, you know, this enormous list which doesn't have any definition associated with it. So, I mean, we see this in computer land where we're typing a word document um, and it comes up with a spell check. Now that's being informed by a list of words. It doesn't necessarily have the definition for the words, but whether the word exists or not and how you spell it is in, in that list. Um, now, controlled lists. Um, control this, I mean, I, I said in the note there, they're explained by the word, it's a list that's controlled. Um, and where this gets a little bit interesting for us in this vocabulary land is that usually we have a, uh, some interesting arrangement as to how a list is controlled. So we may say something like, there is a consortium uh, of parties in some research field that wants to control a particular list. And so the easiest thing you could do, of course, would be to put a list online and have some uh, governance mechanism that allows people to update that list. Um, so some good examples of that for this community and for large scientific communities are things like the climate and forecast conventions for um, for uh, NetCDF and for and for atmospheric data. There's a there's a body, um, the CS uh, administration group, um, and they maintain a control list. And they, they they do and they can maintain it just as a text file on the web. You know, here is all the terms in our recognized term list and it's controlled. Um, so I think that's fairly straightforward. Um, but of course, yes, we can, you know, control this, you know, either by one person or an organization or, or a consortia. Okay, so a slightly more interesting um, vocab in a various guise to consider is a folksonomy. So, um, so I define folksonomy, I and mean, there are some Works that have defined folksonomies, including, and I haven't got the reference here, the first time the word was coined was a guy on a blog post, a technical blog, and he's defined it in this way, and that definition still stands. I'm, I'm going to approximate that definition now. Um, it's really an accretive tag list. So it's a list of tags that you can apply to digital objects, or I guess if you want to write them down, non digital objects, but um, it's, it's accretive, so it's, it's additive. Um, what we're talking about here is something that was born out of a web 2.0 scenario where people wanted to be able to have multiple users contributing knowledge to an environment, you know, maybe a collection of, of, of blog posts or items or something. Um, and so you start off with no tags or maybe an administrator would create 10 tags, something to segment the data. And then people can go and either reuse those tags or create their own tags. Um, and so the folk, folk element of it is that you've got a, a you know a, um, a very democratic and you know hippie free easy loving community of people who can go and tag content um, and uh, 
the first kinds of folks that were around were for social media sites of various sorts. Um, now, they can be controlled or semi-controlled. Um, you could, for instance, have a folksonomy which is restricted to logged in users. That would be one way to control who can tag content. Or it can be open tagged, or it can be uh, you, only certain users can tag things in a certain way. So there's all these different sort of variations there. Um, if you were to just Google folksonomy and definition, you would be able to find out most of that information, I think. Um, now, the thing that makes folksonomies uh, really interesting, it, it's the element that they're using this technology, the internet, to allow people to connect and to tag things, um, and that they facilitate other tools. So one thing that a folksonomy would facilitate is a faster search. If you've tagged a whole bunch of content um, with however you've generated those tags, whether they're, whether they're good tags or bad tags, you can actually use them in a faceted search mode. So that's one thing they do. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of fun widgets where you can do things like do tag cloud visualization. So I'll just see if I can open another tag, another browser tab, and I'm hoping that I can get to it because the Zoom meeting seems to have hidden some of my browser tabs. I'll try and get there, let's see. There, okay, so for people who haven't seen this sort of thing, probably most of you have, um, this is a visualization of the popularity of tags in a particular environment. Um, and so the word people is very big because the tag people has been used lots of times. So, um, you know, the word you can see inside the P of people um, or inside the O of people, the word part has been used fewer times. Um, so it's smaller. Now, um, these don't necessarily, these terms don't have to have come from a folksonomy, but this is a typical application of a folksonomy. You've got a website there, people are tagging content, and then for fun, you can see what's the most popular tag, and you can do it in a way that I've done here, or that someone's done here, which is to visualize it with the size proportional to the use. Okay. Um, so uh, we often, or I've often fielded questions about the relation between folksonomies and vocabularies and so on. And it's, it's really mostly around that notion of what level of control you have um, and whether the list is an open list or a closed list. Um, you could have, for instance, a control vocabulary that is open in that you can add new terms to it, but the mechanism through which you add those terms is quite restricted or controlled or organized in some way. Now, I've put tag list down there because the, the word tag list, I've used it 10 times myself, it comes up, essentially see above, see the folks on the uh, definitions. Okay, now, I'll, before I get onto ontologies, I'm just gonna show a couple of tabs, again, if I can, physically get to it in my, in my browser, um, that are showing some, some instances of what I've just talked about. Okay, um, so here's the Wikipedia definition of folksonomy. I don't expect people to read it now, but if you Wikipedia, it's a good definition that explains what's going on there, and it's got all the bits that I've mentioned, social tagging, collaborative, etc. cetera. Um, now, some examples of, um, of folksonomies in use are things like these well, social bookmarking sites, Delicious Flickr, all of those kinds of websites that um, uh, want to aggregate a whole bunch of content and then make that content available through uh, tags so that people can find all the photos about the koalas or something like that. Um, now, let's see. Um, now, I just wanted to show, in addition to, uh, in addition to those sort of vanilla folksonomies, there are content management systems out there and the one I personally use is Drupal, but there's lots of them um, that allow tagging. Um, and depending on how you set them up, they can allow folksonomy style tagging or more controlled vocabulary style tagging. So Drupal has a concept of a thing called a taxonomy. And you can set the taxonomy up to allow um, any users to add terms to it or only to allow administrators to add terms to it. And that, and that gives you then the, the option of essentially implementing a folksonomy or, or some kind of more controlled list. Um, now you could, for instance, um, call that list a vocabulary. It could be a, a controlled vocabulary whereby, yeah, only a few designated people can go and implement that thing. So you could implement, for instance, sorry, add terms to that thing. You could, for instance, implement the uh, climate and forecast conventions as tags within Drupal and have the Climate and Forecast Consortia administer that. That would be a, a technical implementation then of that control list. 
So I just want that, that's common practice for content management systems. Okay, now, again, sorry about the fiddling, but I'm really struggling to see my browser tabs. I'll just move this down a little bit. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go into uh, the, the difference between vocabularies and ontologies, and then from there I will mention the, the, the stuff that Simon was going to mention at least for a minute or two. Um, I've probably blown out my time or close to it. Kim, how am I going for time? Am I, am I way over? Sorry, I just had to unmute. Um, no, you're not way over, and because we're missing Simon's, it, it doesn't matter, so that, that's fine. So. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll finish up as I intended, then I think we'll be okay. All right, um, <clears throat> so one source of confusion, when people hear about vocabularies and then they hear about these semantic web style vocabularies and so on, they then inevitably encounter ontologies, um, and so then uh, some discussion about what's a vocabulary and what's an ontology is needed. Now, um, I've got a kind of set piece definition of an ontology there. Um, so ontologies are really conceptual models of information or knowledge within a domain. So you would say this ontology represents uh, the real world concept linking to do with fish species or to do with um, uh, the history of data manipulation or any domain. Um, the ontology is to, is to set the, the classes and the relations of the things in that space. Um, now ontologies I've underlined the word working there because ontologies in the semantic web land can be used uh, to validate instances of information. So you could say, does this uh, RDF data set that I've made, is it conformant with some particular ontology in some particular domain? So that we can do that. Now, ontologies don't have to or don't have control lists in them. So you may say something like, um, in my ontology, uh, this ontology is about the creation of data sets. And every data set has to be created by a person. So that's what the ontology tells you. And then a vocabulary will tell you something like, well, these are the data sets that have been created, or these are the people that create data sets. So um, the ontology is telling you the relation between those things and their classes, and then the vocabulary is giving you the individuals. Um, now, I'll mention the, the um, so in RDF vocabulary land, a common, uh, crossover sort of between vocabulary and ontology or, or dual use of those two concepts is SCOS. So that's the Simple Knowledge Organization System. It itself is an ontology and what SCOS is telling you is it's saying uh, this is how you organize all the information uh, to do with concept definitions uh, um, and the things that you expect to see in a dictionary. So yeah, definitions, labels, etc, etc. So it's an ontology that's basically telling you how to make a dictionary. And then what you typically do is you go and make a dictionary of the terms that you want. So maybe you listed, you know, um, all of the concepts to do with uh, fishing or something like that. So you've used the SCOS ontology to go and make a vocabulary for your particular purpose. Now SCOS has quite a lot of properties, some of which you don't see in traditional paper dictionaries. Uh, it has the preferred label of a concept, it will have alternate labels which could be acronyms for that concept or alternate spellings or, or whatever. It can have different language variants um, and, it, and SCOS also has um, something which you, you don't see in dictionaries uh, which is a, a, um, a hierarchy of terms. So you can say these terms are broader or narrower versions of other terms and that's really what SCOS's big power is. Or you can get definitions for terms and, and alternate labels and you can get the version of you know, the words cat in English and in Polish or something like that. But you can also say, well, a cat is actually a type of feline and so is a lion, you know, that sort of thing. That's really what SCOS is about. Um, now, there is one final sort of layer to this. Oh, sorry, and I should mention that SCOS itself is a W3C standard and there's an awful lot of documentation about SCOS. Um, and I'm sure that this would, would be happy to send out some links uh, to some resources that we've found useful. And obviously, Anne's know all about SCOS. Um, now, the only other extension to that that I'm going to mention is that you can actually use uh, ontologies other than SCOS to make vocabularies. So you could say something like, I would like to list, uh, uh, make a vocabulary of people, of people that work at Geoscience Australia, say. And then what you could do is you could use an ontology that's about people 
um, to define what a person is, and then your list of individual peoples would become your vocabulary. Now, that's not necessarily a SCOS vocabulary at all. In fact, it's not a SCOS vocabulary. Um, it's using some other classification. SCOS is used for general purpose concepts, um, and we typically then see it for definitions of words, but you can create vocabularies for anything you want, really, any kind of object. Now, um, I'll put a link in there, but again, I can send it out. I recently made a vocabulary that does uh, two things. It defines a whole bunch of code lists that we need to use in a certain environment, and it defines them as SCOS concepts. So there is a, a SCOS-based vocabulary there that says these things are you know, uh, lists of terms, and, and this is what their definition is, and this is their, their label, et cetera, et cetera, and this is their hierarchy. And then in addition to that, there is a broader or a, a non-SCOS ontology which says, oh, by the way, that list of things are also types of rocks or they are types of methods or there, there's additional information there. Um, so if people want to study the difference between a SCOS-based vocabulary and a more general or a, a non-SCOS-based vocabulary, um, they can look at that file there. Now, I appreciate that that's not very much fun for people looking at encoded files, um, so I might, uh, I'm going to come out with better um, uh, better uh, images and, and documentation for that pretty soon. But I just wanted to highlight that that, that kind of thing does exist um, because we are, we are mostly going to be dealing, I think, in the short term with SCOS-based vocabularies, uh, but occasionally we'll come across these other vocabularies. 